good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us at uh, UVix Beers. I'm really excited to see everybody. Uh, also a bit nervous because, you know, everybody has living, been living in lockdown, not seeing anybody for so long, and then, ah, oh, let's talk in front of a lot of people. But you all look friendly, so I guess everything will be fine. Um, so I want to talk to you about what UX designers can learn from architects. And you might wonder, how did I uh, arrive at this topic? And it actually, um, I thought about this when I try to explain my job to uh, people, uh, my friends and my family, who don't work in a digital or tech environment. And if I tell them I'm a UX designer, I always get this response, like, whoa what's a UX designer? Um, and then I actually compared it to architecture. Um, it, it was an easy way to explain if I told them, okay, um, well, a UX designer is like what, uh, a UX designer is for software like what an uh, architect is for a building. Um, then they understood, because we, we kind of do the same. We explain to a developer how it's, what they should build, how it should look like, how it should behave, who is it for, who are the, the inhabitants, <laughs> the users. Um, and then while I was thinking about it, I thought there are actually a lot of more overlap. So maybe we can also learn from uh, architecture and use that and apply it to UX design. And while I was doing my research, I also found out that there were a great number of architects who made the switch to UX design and wrote uh, an article about it. So I was definitely onto something. And who am I? Um, well, I've been a UX designer since 2011, um, but I actually, I accidentally rolled into it because I graduated as a translator. So I have a background in linguistics. Uh, well, 10 years later, I'm still a UX designer, so must be doing something right. Um, I've uh, recently started working as a UX CX specialist at Kipling, and I work there in the digital team. And together with the team, I make sure that um, customers have a seamless experience to uh, browse products and buy them. And uh, previously, I was at iKips, which is a digital agency. So I've worked there for six years, and I've done several uh, projects in different sectors, um, like aviation, uh, entertainment, gaming, you name it. Um, oh, the lights are off. <laughs> is, it, is it so bad? <laughs> uh, I want to talk to you about uh, three things. The similarities between UX and architecture, the differences, and uh, six lessons that we can learn from architects. So let's dive in with the obvious similarities. <laughs> Um, both architecture and UX design are very user-centric. They are, yeah, you design for people. If you design a building, it's for the inhabitants, the people that will use the building, that will visit the building. Uh, if it's a bridge, that's people that will go over the bridge. If it's a museum, the people that will visit the museum. And uh, if we design an app or a website, we design it for the people that interact with it. So it's both very user-centric. Um, very high level, it also has four of uh, the same uh, process steps, so very high level because of course I'm not including uh, testing or anything. Um, you first analyze, and this is an example of uh, an, uh, a, sorry, a site analysis uh, that architects make where they look at the geo geography, the topography, um, they also need to look at the uh, demographics, um, if there are any constraints from the um, uh, legal constraints, the city regulations. Um, and another technique that works actually both for UX design and architecture is a focus group. For a focus group, you invite people and ask them about their uh, ideas and opinions. Um, for an app, for example, if you want to um, make an app to um, fill in a tax form, then you would gather people and ask them how they fill in their taxes, taxes now, how they would uh, do it differently, what are their, yeah, what are their issues now, uh, how would they like to see it. Uh, but you can also do that if you want to build a shopping mall and you want to find out what the needs are, uh, then you also organize a focus group to talk to people. Then you take the result of that analysis and you start designing or a building, or you turn it into a screen. 
Next, to see if your design works in practice, you build a prototype. Uh, this is an example of uh, Antonio Gaudí's uh, Sagrada Familia. And it's actually the building upside down. Uh, if you see, those are uh, catenary arches. So the Sagrada Familia is, um, is built up of catenary arches. And what that means is the pressure of the arch is the same in both directions. So either upside down or standing up. So in order to test um, the pressure of his arches in the Sagrada Familia, Antonio Gaudí just hang uh, chains, uh, weights on chains to, to test the pressure because it would work in the other direction as well. So that was a very easy way to make a prototype of the building. And then for a user interface, you can do uh, rapid prototyping on paper or you can use specific tools to make uh, high fidelity clickable uh, mockups uh, like this one, or you can test uh, user interactions as if it were a real working app. And then last, the last step is to start building um, yeah, for a building that's on a construction site and for a website or an app, it's in code. Obviously, there are also a lot of differences between uh, architecture and UX design. And the first one I want to talk about is space. Um, architecture deals with the physical space and UX design with the digital space. And I've marked that with an asterisk because, of course, in the physical world, there's, there's a lot of UX design all around us. But um, for this talk, I, want to, uh, I really want to talk about uh, digital UX design. So. Um, to really make that comparison. Um, you can see that designing for the physical space has a lot more constraints <coughs> because you need to take into account the laws of physics. You cannot just randomly build something and hope that it will stay up. You need to uh, take a set of rules into account. You cannot make a building from paper, for example. Um, and for designing uh, an app, there are some technical constraints, of course, but there's a lot more freedom to, uh, to do what you want. The process length is uh, the next big difference. Um, designing and building uh, a bridge or uh, a house or a museum, that can take months or even up to years. Um, and it's a slow and long process. It's very rigid. Uh, there's little wiggle room. Once uh, the materials are there and you start building, then you just need to follow the plans. There's, yeah, you can just, uh, in the middle of the, of the plan, just change something. Um, and for building an app, that's different because, um, well, it goes a lot faster. It can take uh, weeks or months and uh, a working MVP can even be done in a couple of days. And it's a very agile way, way of working. If you work in sprints, then you can evaluate after each sprint if you're still on the right track, and then you can still uh, change things to, to move uh, in the right direction again. Last, um, sorry, not the last one. <laughs> the lifespan uh, of a building is more than 100 years. So yeah, architects really need to look into the future. They need to think about how will the world look uh, in 100 years, and will my building, will my design withstand the sands of time? Not so much for uh, digital design, for UX design. Um, most apps get a major update after one or three years and smaller updates along the way. So nothing is really set in stone. Of course, you need to get the groundwork right. But um, yeah, you don't have to think about how will my app look in 100 years because the chances that it's still there is close to none. Uh, and then testing is a, a point where UX designers actually have it also a bit easier than architects um, because software can be tested with users in several uh, feedback loops. Um, up front, when you're just in the prototyping phase where you can uh, test with users even before it's built, and afterwards on a live product, you can still do uh, A-B testing and see how, um, how the product is used and then keep adapting uh, as you gain new insights. Not so much for buildings. Uh, once it's finished, there's not so much you can do to respond to user feedback. You cannot uh, move a room to another side because apparently it was better on the other side of the, of the building. So uh, for architects, it's, it's even more important to get all the user feedback up front to make sure they do it right uh, on the, first, the first time. What lessons can we draw from that? 
Lesson one is a form follows function. This is a principle that was coined by uh, Louis Sullivan. Uh, it was an American architect who lived between 1865 uh, and 1924. It's um, a principle of modern ar architecture and it's been widely used since the beginning of the 20th century. Um, it states that a building or an object should primarily uh, relate to its, its function, so to, uh, to its intended function or purpose. This is a good example of form follows function. This is a Kenyan mud hut. Um, and it's actually one of the first architectural designs. Its primary function is of course to give shelter. Give shelter against sun, against rain, against heat, and to ward off insects. Uh, well, if you look at it, it has a thatched roof, which uh, blocks out the sun. And the walls are made of mud. And mud is actually a very good insulator um, if you if you are inside the hut, it can be about 10 degrees colder than it is. Uh, I don't have power, sorry. Than it is um, outside of the hut, uh, and the walls also have a plaster of dung, which might sound disgusting to us, but uh, it's actually a water repellent. So uh, if it's raining, then the mud doesn't just uh, slide off, um, and it's also uh, it also wards off uh, bugs. And if you look at the shape. It's a round shape because with the materials, that's just the easiest shape to build. So this is actually a great example of form follows function. It's not very pretty looking, but it does everything that it should do. And this is an example from the website uh, Ugly Belgian Houses, which some of you may know. <laughs> um, there is really no functional reasons to make these door openings like that. Um, it's, yeah, I don't know why. And you can even say that the form hinders the function because it's really narrow. If you want to move with your groceries through the door, it's just very, very impractical. So form does not follow function here. How can we apply this to UX design? Um, I guess most of you know uh, Dribbble. Um, it's very much applicable to the, the dribbleization of design. And that's a trend that was first described in a Medium article by Paul Adams in 2016. I've included the link there if you want to read it. Um, you, on Dribbble, there's a lot of uh, digital design and uh, also a big part is UI design. And if you look at it, it looks pretty, so nice, very shiny designs. Everybody shows off their great UI design, but the focus is mainly on the, on the visual part. Uh, most of these designs have not been used in the real world. There's nothing behind it. There's no business need behind it, no user need behind it. It's not been tested with real data. So it's just something that looks nice and that's it. Um, I've actually had clients who showed me a design on Dribbble and told me, I want this just only based on the fact that it looks nice. There was no, no, yeah, they didn't uh, question if, if it was uh, right for their use case, if, uh, if their users would uh, find it user friendly, if, if they would find what they were looking for. So I think the lesson that we can draw here from, uh, from Louis Sullivan is that we always need to be vigilant for these types of questions and that we need to make sure that our designs are primarily functional and not just look pretty, but, Big but, it's also important to balance usability with aesthetics. And let me quote uh, Buckminster Fuller. When I'm working on a problem, I never think about beauty. I only think about how to solve the problem. But when I have finished, if the solution is not beautiful, I know it is wrong. Buckminster Fuller was an architect who was uh, very well known for his geodesic domes. This is an example of that. A uh, ge uh, geodesic dome is constructed of triangles, as you can see here. And the triangle, um, it's very strong because it can withstand pressure from three sides. Um, so if you build a dome from triangles, it's uh, very light and strong at the same time. And it's actually up to the present day, one of the most uh, efficient uh, and strongest uh, ways of uh, building uh, a structure. Uh, what you see here is the Avio dome in a skip hole. It was finished in uh, 1971, and it's, uh, it consists of 1,100 aluminum plates. And the plates were constructed in the United States, then shipped to Schiphol, and then they were built up on site. Uh, and it served as a museum for aviation until 2003. 
and then it was taken apart again and then moved to uh, Amsterdam and now it is a conference center since 2018 and it looks like this. So I guess we can say that the usability of this design, it's, it's superb, it's strong, it's light and you can take it apart and build it up again somewhere else. And of course it's a matter of taste, but in my opinion it's aesthetically very pleasing. I really like how it looks. Now for buildings we can easily understand why, why it should look nice. It takes up a very big part of our environment. We need to look at it all the time and we don't want to look at something ugly. Um, for user interface, it's also important that, that it looks good because uh, user research has shown that users um, perceive something that looks good as something that works better. Uh, it's called the aesthetic usability effect. Um, and it's a tendency of users to perceive something attractive as something more usable. Um, they have a positive uh, connection with your design, uh, sorry, with your interface. And because of that, they have more tolerance for minor usability issues. Um, it's uh, an effect that has been uh, researched and, uh, and uh, proven as well by the Nielsen Norman group. So that's why it's still important to not only make your website functional, but to also make sure that it doesn't look very ugly <laughs> because that has, a, that has an impact on how people perceive uh, your website or your app. Third lesson, think in big problems. Why? Um, because uh, I will quote uh, another designer and architect and furniture designer. As designers, we have such power to make designs change the world. We really need to make better use of our platform and do stuff that is useful. As architects, um, yeah, architects need to think about big systemic problems like healthcare. If they build a hospital, they need to make sure that um, they can keep the patients happy and, and healthy. It's proven that um, your physical welfare, if, if you feel good, then you heal faster. So it's important that if an architect design, designs a, a hospital, that um, he designs a room so that the patient feels at ease and feels happy and then he can uh, heal faster. Um, also think about the layout. How can we make the layout of the rooms in a specific way that the staff can, uh, can tend the, the patients uh, easier, that they can uh, go from patient to patient easier without having to run around three floors. Another thing is education. Uh, if an architect designs a school, they also need to think about how can we um, make sure that the students are encouraged to go to school if they need to spend their day, the whole day in class, if, if, if that is a room that, um, that they are encouraged to go to, that they're encouraged to learn and that they, have, um, that they are stimulated creatively and so on. Um, for society, um, how do we provide housing in uh, overcrowded cities? How we do, do we make um, affordable housing? And this is an example from Amsterdam. Um, it's uh, called Funenpark and it's 550 units. Uh, they were built on an old industrial site, so it was not used anymore. So these are the kind of projects that have a really great impact on, on the world around us. Um, they really make a difference in people's lives. And I think as UX designers, we can do the same. And it's already been done. Uh, here's an example of a Too Good To Go. Uh, I guess a lot of people already know the app. And that was an answer to food waste. That's a very big problem. Um, restaurants and uh, food stores, they throw away so much food. There's so much food waste. Um, it's really causing a, a big uh, impact on the environment. Um, so the creators uh, of this app they offered a solution for uh, restaurants and food stores that they can, at the end of the day, they could sell their leftovers for a reduced price and this way um, reduce their, uh, their food waste. Another good example is Samaritan. It's a project by the city of Seattle. Um, Seattle has one of the largest homeless populations in the, in the United States. Um, and with this project, they wanted to connect the citizens of Seattle with each other, both the homeless and the homes. Um, homeless people can um, subscribe to the app and, and, uh, and tell their story, be it anonymously or uh, with, a, with their picture and their name, like in this example. 
Um, and then uh, people that subscribe on the platform can choose to uh, donate. So they can read their story uh, and they think, okay, I want to donate $3, $5 more. Um, and some of the homeless uh, people who participate also have a Bluetooth beacon around their neck. Um, and if you pass them in the street and they're close by, then uh, you get an alert on your app indicating that somebody on the platform is nearby and then uh, you can read their story. And that was really the goal to make people connect. The slogan is uh, walk with, not by. Um, because it's, it happens so often that you, you pass somebody who is homeless and you don't think about what they have been through or, or how they've ended up there. And uh, this app is a way of telling their story so that you can connect and um, and help them get back on their feet. Um, and it was really successful apparently, and it still is, it's still ongoing. 65% uh, of the participants uh, improved their living conditions. So I think that's quite amazing. Uh, and these are two, both uh, Too Good To Go and Samaritan are two examples of how thinking in big problems can have spectacular results. So I encourage all of you to do the same. Lesson four is question everything. And for this, I quote Aileen Gray, who was an Irish architect and furniture designer. She said, to create, one must first question everything. And what she meant by that is, yeah, we should question design as we know it. Look at a chair. Why does it look like this? Can we do it differently? Can we make it more, can we make it multifunctional? Can we uh, make it uh, suitable for mass production? So she, um, she had a really revolutionary way of thinking about the existing design. If you see these chairs, um, those are how typical chairs in the 1920s all looked like. So they all had a very similar form. Uh, these are pictures of actual antique chairs that were restorated. And this is a chair that Eileen Gray designed in 1920, so it's completely different. Uh, it's called a Bibendum chair. Um, it's named after that because uh, Bibendum is the mascot of a Michelin, you know, Michelin man. Um, she was inspired by the shape of it. Um, and she designed the chair, the chair like this because she wanted a very comfortable chair that felt like it was hugging her. If I go back to these, well, don't feel, really feel like I'm being hugged by these chairs, but this chair, yeah, it feels like it's hugging me. Uh, and her designs worked so well that they are still sold up to today. So if you want to spend 1,000 euros on the table, this is the place to be. How to apply that to UX design is, well, UX designers also need to question everything. Um, just because something was always done in a specific way doesn't mean that we need to keep doing it that way and that there's no better way to do it. Um, here is an example of a country selector uh, that I found and it's done like this on hundreds of websites. Uh, most web forms still do it like this. So it's a very long list where you need to select a country. And well, you need to select it from a list because just for the, the data input, it needs to be correctly input in the database. That's why it can be a free, a free text field. But yeah, it's a very long list. Um, it's very hard to get an overview and often the sorting is also not clear. Uh, as an example, I was once looking for Belgium in the list. So I scrolled to the B or I typed on the B, I don't know anymore. And it was not there because apparently there was a separate uh, group of uh, most selected countries at the top of the list so that you could find it more easily, which obviously did not work <laughs> because I couldn't. Um, but anyway, luckily I have seen some websites who do it better. So there have already been designers who thought, uh, yeah, who have questioned this and thought of a better design pattern. This is an example of uh, Baymart um, and you can just type in there and it gives you also partial uh, results and synonyms. So if I type in Holland, it will give me the Netherlands. So um, it's making it as easy as possible to select a country from a list. This is another fun one. I guess you have all been frustrated by this. Um, this is uh, from Mega Cloud Storage. Um, if you want to create an account, you need to choose a password and then you need to repeat it because it's hidden for security reasons. And if you make a typo, then you don't see it. So that's why you need to repeat it to make sure you have entered the correct password. But then what happens is, yeah, 
I've mistyped, so now I have to do it all over again. Very frustrating. This can be done in a better way, and luckily, <laughs> there have been designers who have been smart enough to do it in another way. Because the problem is, you can't see your password, so that's why you need to repeat it, because you don't know what you've typed. So why not offer the solution to uh, make it possible to show it briefly so that you can actually see if you haven't misspelled your passwords. Uh, this is an example from Zalando. Um, very good experience, much better than the previous one where I can just check briefly and then confirm. So I will repeat, question everything. These patterns, they are still used, the bad ones, they are still used on a lot of websites, on a lot of apps. It doesn't work well, there are better solutions. So everybody just keeps copying, and copying them without questioning because it has always been done like this. So please question everything. A general lesson that we can draw from architecture is to uh, draw inspiration from the physical world. Um, the benefit is that if we look at both the physical and the digital world, we can see connections between the two and draw inspiration from it. Um, yeah, and, and, and really connect the two worlds. Imagine if you're uh, designing uh, an app for uh, online grocery shopping. If you look at um, a physical grocery store, you can look at how it is designed, how are the ales designed, how are the products grouped together, what is the layout of the, f uh, of the floor plan, um, and you can incorporate this way of thinking into the online experience. Um, this is also an Albert Hain, the website, and as you can see, like in the physical store, the products are grouped together um, based on the type of product, and then those groups are grouped together in larger groups, like uh, with the salads, pizzas, and the meals. Um, so they are one group, and if you've ever been to Albert Heijn, uh, you will know that at the actual physical store, they are also next to each other in the same aisle. Um, so that's actually very well done, because then you have a connection between the physical world and the digital, digital world, and that helps your users to navigate, because they have a yeah, it's, it maps with their mental model of the world. If you would be designing uh, a website to uh, buy or borrow ebooks, you can think about how libraries are designed. The books are displayed, you can, uh, they're displayed on shelves, you can look at the covers, you can um, flip through them to see if it's interesting. Um, and if you then look at the uh, open library, they do this really well to uh, replicate this browsing experience. Um, they have, they actually have shelves, so there's still a search um, uh, field. If you know which book you're looking for, you can just type in the title, but if you don't, you're just thinking, I want a book about technology, you can actually browse the shelves and look around and, uh, and also uh, look at a preview of the book. So this really connects with this physical experience of being in a library. The last lesson I want to share with you is to make it super obvious. Um, if you design a building, then things always look like uh, people expect it to do. There are no weird things like stairs not leading to any floors or a floor with, without a stair leading to it or uh, windows, um, sorry, curtains without windows behind it or doors that are ambiguous. And especially for uh, PIM on the popular request, let's talk about Norman doors. <laughs> it wasn't actually in it, but I thought, ah, oh, there's a door. <laughs> so uh, Norman door, for those uh, who are not familiar with the concept, is a design element. Uh, well, they, it has design elements that give you the wrong usability signals to the point that instructions are needed to explain how it works. So if you see here, this door has a handle, so you think I should pull it. But no, no, you don't have to pull it, you need to push it. So there are instructions to make sure that you push it. So uh, yeah, really confusing. Um, well, the images that I showed you earlier from the building, it had a really comical effect because you don't expect this. A, a building should, yeah, it should always do what you expect it to do. You don't look at a stair and think, oh, I don't know what it does or what it leads to. It's just, yeah, it's always very obvious what, what a design element inside of a building does. 
And the same should be true for a user interface. A button needs to look like a button and a link needs to look like a link and it should be obvious what each element in the interface does. So we can be inspired by how that works inside of a building if we design an interface. Yeah, okay, there was a book about it, sorry. Uh, Don, Don Norman wrote a book and that's why it's called The Norman Door. I forgot that I was going to tell that. Um, Here's a good example. If you go to the website of Air France, on your phone you're directed to the mobile website. And then you get two questions. Do you want to be redirected to the mobile site? Uh, yes or no, take me to the mobile site. Okay, very confusing. Uh, and this one, yeah, I really hate it. I booked my train ticket today through the app and got confronted with it again. It has checkboxes. But they're not checkboxes, because if you tap on it, you can only select one option. So it's radio buttons. So it's, this is not obvious. Okay, after two seconds it is, but um, I, yeah, you shouldn't make your user think twice. That's, uh, don't do that. Another one I want to share with you is I have an app to connect my e-bike uh, to check the battery. And I've had this app for a good two months before I realized that Oh, if I swipe on the screen, then I see other stats. And unfortunately, when I made the video, the stats were not working. Um, yeah, you see an error on the top. There's supposed to be uh, weather statistics. Uh, but uh, like here, if you swipe left and right, then uh, you can switch between speed and a map. And if you swipe up and down, then you can switch between different statistics. Just found that out by accident because there is no visual cue uh, at all that would tell me that. Um, so, yeah, why can't a user interface be like a building? I mean, have you ever seen a building where you should stroke a wall and then suddenly a door appears? That, that doesn't happen. So, um, yeah, if you're designing a user interface, uh, keep that in mind. <laughs> and then lastly, if you want to deep dive into architectural thinking, I can recommend the book uh, Think Like an Architect by Randy Deutsch. Uh, this focuses mainly on critical thinking from the point of view that this is the most uh, important part of being an architect. Because if you make an error as an architect, then people can get hurt. <laughs> You're uh, responsible for the, the well-being of the people inside the building. Um, and I think that as UX designers, we have that same responsibility. Our decisions can also have serious impacts on people's lives. And I don't know if you've ever seen the talk by Mike Montero, um, how uh, how designers destroy the world. Um, you can easily find it online, it's a TED talk. And he gives some real life examples of how design decisions have actually had a very negative impact on people's life. Um, so I think honing your critical skills can make you a better UX designer. And that was all I had to share with you today. If there are any questions. <laughs> <laughs> Translates <laughs> questions and to the questions in the online forum. So, are there any questions, anyone? Feel free to. Yeah. yeah. Specifically for web forms, or yeah. Is that like a centralized repository for yeah? What do I need to do to build, to build my uh, correct forms? Yeah. So for a web forms specifically, I would recommend a web form designed by Luke Rablewski. It's a book. It's entirely about forms. It's a pretty old book. I think it was published in 2014 or something. But it's still very uh, yeah up to date because the principles that are used are still very. Uh, Actual. Also yeah. Old, yeah. Like yeah. 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 Still valid. <laughs> yeah. Do you have something more online for the points you have to give it for the web developers? Look at it. Look there. Look. Uh, oh, 
Yeah, that really depends on the on the project. If there's a specific example that I know that a, a big player does it like this, then it always helps to use it as a reference. Because mm -hmm. um, yeah, if Google does something a specific way and, and it's proven that it works well, then it's always easy to say, oh, but look at Google, they do it like this, and it's usually a good reference. <laughs> yeah. Google has the, the study system published as well. Yeah. With guidelines. Yeah. With Thank you. Any other questions? Feel free to. No. Well, not to present thanks for me from the online. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I, that's one of the techniques I've used, yeah. Yeah, and how do you think of, like, if we compare user groups versus why am I going to do this? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm always resistant to a focus group to inform your design. Because I think yeah. you, it's, it's a bit biased. You always have someone that's a bit louder or, yeah. you know, someone that just will say yes to follow. Mm -hmm. Like everyone are everyone is saying. Yeah, but that's, that's. Sorry, oh. So the question yep. was, <laughs> we need to figure out a better solution for the Q&A. We're we'll working on that. If anyone has any suggestions, find me afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, no, the, the question was, um, how does focus groups versus one-on-one -on -one interviews, um, how does that how get? Does the yeah, yeah how, how do you deal with the issue? Like, in a focus group, the loudest is usually the, the predominant opinion versus a one-on-one -on -one is a lot more deep dive. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, um, yeah, a lot can already be helped uh, by moderating the focus group to actually um, yeah, speak to people who have been silent and ask them, okay, what is your opinion? Do you have something to say about it? And that can already help, that's what I do. Um, and yeah, what you say is true, there's one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews can, uh, as opposed to focus groups and uh, people influence each other in focus groups. That can also be a good thing because sometimes you can build upon somebody else's opinion, something you haven't thought about, and then you can build upon that. So I think it really depends on the type of project and the type of users that you need to interview for that. So don't, don't think I can give a really straightforward answer which one of them is the best. It really depends on the type of project. Yeah. All right, and with that, we are going to, yeah. <laughs> Wrap up. Other questions, Shura will stick around. Yeah. Um, also online, the LinkedIn profile for questions to Shuda is linked in the YouTube uh, comments. Um, so we are going to round off here. We're going to take a quick 10-minute break, and we'll be back at 8 with the next speaker. Great. Thank you again, Shura. <laughs>